what, what I'm going to attempt to talk about is several, several sort of trains of thought from uh, the work of a lot of people put together. You've probably heard the word rail a lot today. You've probably heard the word um, Perf Insights. You saw that psychedelic photo from Dimitri this morning that was sort of the swirly awesomeness, uh, user happiness. Um, the prefix to all of this is uh, moving the web forward in terms of performance is a constantly changing space. We're constantly tr trying to figure out how to do this, how to do it better. Uh, so this is kind of a snapshot in time of where our thinking's at. Uh, some tools that we've got that are kind of working, kind of not working. Uh, if you walk away with just a lot of ideas and a lot of questions, that's, that's really what I'm trying to do here. Uh, not necessarily walk away with like solutions that are perfect. Uh, a lot of people have contributed to the work that we're going to show, so I just want to pause and thank everybody who's uh, put together the codes and the demo and the, and the thinking that we're going to show here. Uh, I'm just an unusually loud guy on the team uh, that got the lucky bit of showing it. So. Slow is the center of the swirling set of optimizations we want to do. And at BlinkOn last year, we tried to start making sense of that. And a little bit less of a, like, here are a zillion metrics and you have to optimize all of them. And switch it more to, like, hey, let's have a couple coherent sets of guidance to help people go faster, including Chrome developers. So out of that came Rail score, uh, Rail. Uh, this is this notion that you have these different kinds of things that users do, and if you accomplish their goal within a certain amount of time, they'll be happier, and that, that really defines their notion of speed and fast. And, uh, and so there's this still surviving notion a year later that if we focus on the user and we focus on quantifying users-based uh, perception of happiness, uh, then good things will follow. Uh, that concept's al alive and well, but we, we don't really have a standard implementation of how to measure this. So there's no like histogram out there that says, oh, this is how to measure rail, right? Um, so this is what we've been trying to do uh, originally. Uh, Wikipedia did this a while ago. They, they literally printed out a DevTools timeline and then started marking it up. And if you actually think about it, that's how we work too, right? We all crack open the trace file, we dig through it. It's kind of a very manual process. Um, couldn't we make this automatic? So when we started this, we thought, okay, what we'll do is we'll try to compute a rail score. And we'll like, find the main thread, and we'll track like, what rail stage we're in. So when you mouse down, you'll like, say you're in the R stage. When you mouse up, you'll be in the not R stage. And then da-da-da-da-da, we'll add up some times. And whenever your time is over, you're violating the rail model, and your score should be bad. Um, so, you know, you go, okay, look, that, that should be possible. Let's try to code that up. Uh, you find these corner cases that are really tough that make this quite a bit harder. And the corner cases come from the fact that we're a really optimized browser. We've put years and years and years of optimizations into this stupid thing. So when you mouse down and you mouse up, you still have compositor thread work to do. So you have rasterization. So when you have a click, Blink may respond very, very fast, but you have this giant honking image decode task that still has to run. So you have to factor that into your response calculation. So that makes things hard. And this is actually just a graph of uh, a single uh, mouse down. And it's not even broken out by thread. So this is the, you can count the number of squares here, but this is all the threads we hop to uh, in order to do just one scroll down, um, compactly visualized. You have to have all these systems, plus a few more that aren't shown in this one, all instrumented in order to get a, a proper picture of response. Um, sometimes response doesn't follow the same path. So when you mouse down uh, or you scroll with a, with a touch uh, and the page has no touch handler, you're never going to notify the main thread on the critical path. You, you scroll the page and then later we tell the, the page that the page has moved. Um, so the critical path changes dynamically based on the content. So we can't even develop sort of a static, like, okay, from here to here is a response, and from here to here is a, is a whatever. There's a lot of dyna dynamism. Dynamism. There's a lot of dynamism in the, the way that our system works. And so computing a metric for it is tough. Um, when you have a very busy main thread, uh, when you tap down to when the message loop frees up to actually process the work, 
you can have 100 input events queued up. And so then the question is, is, is the user respond, is this a response or an animate? So if we tap down on the page, we scroll it down and the page updates at 60 hertz, and the main thread is blocked because it's doing JavaScript, is that an R or an A or what, what letter is that, right? So that was kind of like, oh, darn it, we're gonna have to do something. And another thing that Rail doesn't really capture quite yet is this problem of like, let's say I've got a task and it's taking eight milliseconds, and then I optimize it and now it takes six milliseconds or four milliseconds. I'm hitting the goal. Should my rail score get better? Or am I under the goal so my rail score is the same, right? So clearly, the one on the, the right uh, is using less battery, you know, using less CPU power. Uh, it's not gonna be all that much more responsive, but it's, it's a factor that we have to fact, you know, consider. Anyway, that's a sort of a flavor of why the model that we sort of give for motivating people and explaining things at a high level doesn't quite match to the metrics level. And when you build metrics, you kind of have to deal with all these nasty things. So what I want to do is explain how we think we can actually measure rail. This is prototyped. Uh, we'll show a demo. Um, let's see how it goes. Um, so our rail scoring algorithm is like the following. You start with a trace file. We break the thing up into interaction records. Uh, naming's hard, bear with. Um, once we have the interaction records, we figure out what was associated with each interaction record. So these are like stages. Then for every given sort of interaction and all of its events that are related to it, we'll compute a score for that interaction. And then we apply what's called peak end rule to compute the total overall score of, of the, the total user experience. So a little bit about each step will now follow. Uh, interaction records. So uh, basically it's like a rail stage. We take a trace, a giant trace, and we try to guess within that trace what was happening. So we might take the first bit of the trace and go, oh look, this is just all related to a click handler. So that's an R. And then we take a bit and we say, look, they're clearly scrolling here. This is an A uh, and an I and an L. So we, we segment the trace up like this. Um, the way we do this is really hairy um, and kind of out of scope for, for the talk. Basically, we look at all sorts of different probes throughout the trace. So we look for the input latency events to see when they're tapping on the screen. We'll look for load events to see if there's a uh, page load you know, starting. Uh, and then we look at like events about iframe creation to see if this is an, uh, the top level page being created or just an iframe. Um, and so we do a lot of sort of heuristics. It's all very heuristic driven um, because this isn't in the platform, right? It's not like rail is built into the platform. So we have to kind of guess. Uh, so we have constants that are like, oh, you know, if you see a mouse wheel and then another mouse wheel within 100 milliseconds and it's Mac, they're probably scrolling down. But, you know, that's, is that an animation, right? Um, so there's a lot of heuristics, but at the end we end up with, with a segmentation. Um, at that point, though, you just have the timeline. You kind of have a model of what the user expects, and you have to map that back to what we did. <coughs> so what I've done here is I've tried to show you a, a very simplified trace. where We've got input coming in on the main thread of the browser, and then it hitting sort of the blink thread, and then eventually hitting the compositor thread. If you're idle and there's just JavaScript running, um, the idle work will include, say, that long-running JS block. When you tap down, there's sort of this pipeline that happens to run. So you, you'll have the touch, and then eventually there'll be a queuing delay because of long-running JS. And then you'll have the touch processed on the main thread, and then eventually a draw. And an animate similarly has this sort of warped shape to it. Um, so what we do is we go and we follow all of the different flow events in the, in the trace and any other semantic hints that we can find in the trace, like frame blaming. Um, to figure out, okay, these, these squares in the trace are associated with this original input event. And this is a place where we have yet more heuristics, but we think we can make them harder over time. The output of this is that we have, for a given response, we have a, a model of saying, this response had this computation done by it. And so then we can start saying things like, how efficient was this response? How, how long did it take from the touchdown to the composite. Um, this is kind of visually what's happening. So we're following all these arrows. Um, 
from, from the browser to the compositor thread to the main thread. And we have to follow all of these things and um, resolve corner cases and stuff like that. Uh, Yu Hao is kind of our expert on this, um, as is Ben. Uh, you could ask them about that after the talk. Um, so then, at that point, we have kind of the world broken up into, into different gestures, different interactions, and we know all the work that was done on behalf of that gesture. So we have to now come up with a number. In the original rail formulation, sort of the, the press version, um, rail is, is kind of a, you set these goals, right? You, you will hit 150 milliseconds. And it doesn't really talk about what to do when you exceed 150 milliseconds. Um, a great metric is continuous, so that as you exceed 150 milliseconds, you're not going to get just a jump from your passing to fail, because then you just have a noise generator, right? Um, so we had a lot of soul searching to come up with a, something that was a little continuous. And uh, eventually we settled upon uh, sort of this insight, which is that if we, if we go out and ask everybody here, if we give you a, a button, we, we say, press this button, please. And we add a, a fake delay. And then we wait a bit, and we, we ask you afterward. We say, was that fast enough? Some of you will say yes. Some of you will say no. right? And if we ask enough of you, we think that the response curve is going to look like this, which is that right around 150 milliseconds, a lot of people, below 150 milliseconds, a lot of people are going to be saying yes. And above 150 milliseconds, more and more people are going to be saying, eh, that didn't feel good. right? Maybe if we've had a cup of coffee, we'll be like, low, you know. Everything below 75 milliseconds is good, everything above. So everybody has their own little tipping point. Um, so if we ask a lot of people this, we'll get some sort of histogram. And so if we smooth that out and we kind of process it a little bit, we can get this, this basic thing which says, for a given response time in the, in the trace that we're, we're actually trying to score, how many people were happy with it? What percentage of people were happy with it? And then from that, you get a score for whether this felt fast from 0 to 1 that's nice and continuous. Um, you want to help us test that out? Go to here. Uh, the slides, I'll put up the slide link at the end. But this, this data set, uh, this URL here, takes us to a little test that does exactly this. And uh, we would love everybody to pop over there, open up your laptop sort of at the end. Or if, if you get bored, if you are bored already, try this out. Uh, it'll actually guide you through a bunch of uh, yes-no prompts. So it'll give you a fake delay, see if uh, you think it's fast, and, um, and, uh, and then you can, you can tell us what you think. And then we'll look up, and if we turn out to be wrong, we'll, we'll do another talk in a year and tell, tell you. <laughs> yeah. I don't think you sign in. I think it's, it's pretty anonymous. Um, we're going to do a formal experiment. Basically, we, we, uh, we'll do a grown-up version of this. But for now, um, we're, we're kind of curious if this really holds out. It kind of, I can convince myself that it's probably the case, but it would be pretty cool if we had like science to go with it. Question? Yeah. The, the question was, uh, well, the, the statement was, I, I think there is science about this, and, and uh, indeed there is. It hasn't quite been applied in this way, um, where, where we're trying to distinguish between different types of interactions, right? So a tap versus a scroll versus um, a page load have different thresholds. Um, so that's where it gets a little fuzzy. And the other piece where the science isn't quite showing us uh, clear things is what the shape of the curve is as you exceed the threshold. Um, so. You know, abstractly though, we know that it's it's not it's clearly not the case that this is a discrete function where, when you get over a number, like people are furious, right? But we we know that it falls off. We know there's some curves. Um, so so that's IR scoring. Um, we could talk about that again. Maybe we'll cluster up around the corner afterward and we can brainstorm. That's the short URL. It's kind of fun. Um, Maybe, maybe if we get data, uh, we can share it tomorrow in like a, a lightning talk or at the, at the lightning talk. Um, anyway, but that doesn't quite cover everything. So it was really bugging us that, that even if we did all this scoring and we apply these basic curves to everything, uh, you, could, you could use, you could burn all of the CPUs in the machine and get a perfectly good response score. Right? That just seems somehow morally wrong to me. 
Um, and so we factored in also sort of uh, this case of like, if you're burning CPU, we, we, we downscore you based on how much CPU you, you're using. And we weight basically your responsiveness score, so these, these, whether you're responding within the rail thresholds against the, the amount of CPU that you're burning. And the whole idea here is that we want to really incentivize both behaviors. A uh, great site uses very little CPU and responds in time. And so we cross blend those to get a final score for an interaction. Um, and then from that point, we, we just have a minor little step, which is we take all of the interactions that we found in a trace and we do a weighted average. So there's this basic notion that if you do three things with a machine and one of them is really bad and two of them were great, you're going to remember the bad part of the experience, right? And this is kind of peak end rule. Uh, there are other perceptual concepts here that we could throw out. But really, at the, at the end of the day, what we're after here is that the bad things dominate. and You should fix the bad things first. So we take all of the interactions that you do, we score each one, and then the worst ones uh, dominate your score. Um, and we do it with, with something continuous so that we don't amplify noise. Uh, so I think what I want to do is quickly demo this. Um, so what I have here is um, a trace. So this is what we're used to seeing, right? This is kind of our classic experience of tracing, right? It's like, this is something happening. Um, uh, this is me scrolling TEDx up and down, right? Uh, did you know that? No. Uh, and this is me scrolling Wikipedia cats up and down. And Wikipedia cats has gotten a lot of attention from our team over the last year. Second, probably the list of Pokemon as the most optimized uh, blink page. So this is, this is cats, and uh, this, is, this is the other. And the way it used to was viewed is, is you just see this, and you go, well, it's not that dark, so, and I see regular patterns, so that's probably good, right? Uh, in the New World Order, you get this thing up top, which is the rail stages. So these are all the different rail stages. This is me tapping around to do my recording. And then I marked off here what I was doing. So I, I started scrolling. My finger didn't move very fast, so we thought you went idle. And then I did a lot of scrolls, and there was a long animation, which is me flinging the page down, and then it's done, and I go back to idle. And we have a similar thing here. So at the top of this trace, I did the same exact interaction. I, did a, I began scrolling, which is a response and then a long series of animation, uh, and then I went back to idle. And you see here there's a rail score for each. So I can pop open the rail tab, and I, if I change the selected range, we'll get a different rail score, because a rail score is for a range. Uh, so here the, the score is better, right? 0.8 uh, to 0.6 victory, we have a number. Um, but what the hell does that number mean? So the way to think about this number is, you, with the number, you need a tool. And the tool here that we've got is just a display of those numbers um, based on, on their parts. So like the thing that's dominating this, this uh, score of 0.6 is this bad response is actually really affecting uh, the, the score of the, the, the thing. Whereas the, the animate, which is this white block here, which corresponds to all of this work, um, that's all the work that's being scored for the animate. Um, that has a score of 0.5. And so you can sit here going, okay, well, this is better, and this is, if I want to drive up my overall rail score, I'm going to work on this response first and then on these animates. This isn't quite perfect yet. This is kind of a prototype. We think we have a lot of room for improvement here, um, but I wanted to show you kind of where we're, where we're at. Um, we think this extends pretty easily to other things like checkerboarding. If you have a lot of checkerboarding in the page, then that would be yet another factor. So imagine yet another column in this or we just add in more dimensions that represent a user having a bad time, uh, and then we combine it all up in a similar way. So that as we learn things like, hey, you're leaving the radio on for a long time, that becomes another tick against, say, your efficiency, or you're flashing the screen. If we could detect that in the page, that could be a tick against user comfort, stuff like that. Again, I don't want to say that this is sort of uh, God's truth here. It's just this is our latest latest thinking on the matter. It's a tough nut to crack and we're doing our best. Um, so I hope it's thought provoking and, and you have a lot of questions in your head about, oh, this is wrong. Um, yeah? Uh, the question is, when do we think it achieves the level of maturity to present to web developers? Um, that's a great question. I think still, when I look at these, there's still kind of some oops moments. 
So for example, this, this here, if we sort by score right now, we're pointing at the rail response as incorrect and as the thing to uh, optimize. But clearly, the thing that, that we really should be optimizing is whatever the heck this is. So I don't think we're quite yet clearly pointing at uh, why, what, what to fix. What we're very good at right now, and I'll show in the next demo, what we're pretty good at now is picking up bad, bad uh, sessions from a pile. So if we have 100, 100 traces, we can pretty reliably pick out the one that's bad. Um, so that's good, but I don't think we've gotten yet to a level of precision where we're like, yeah, and this is what to do about it. Um, how to get there other than like testing and being like, oh, that's not yet. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to repeat that, but, uh, yes, Pavel's point is maybe it's sufficient to just point at the problematic range. So if we just said, hey, this rail response is problematic. I think, yeah, th the key thing here is that this is a point 0.5, this animate. So that's still pretty, pretty, like my ideal would be that this number is below the response. So if this was a point four, and we could say, this is the thing, go attack that, then, then I think it would be, but that's the point, we're close. We're, we're like talking about details, so, you know, we'll see. We're, we're getting somewhere, yeah. Uh, the question is, do you think it would be useful to expose this signal? Do you mean to developers or? Oh, well, this is this is in the trace tool. So if you if you all pop open a Canary build, this is right there. So you can you can see this in in Canary. Um, yeah, that's not as transparent. We could probably add a bit. The the question is whether we could improve the transparency of this. Yeah. Yeah, is it, is it useful with developers game on? I mean, developers will game on anything. Um, uh, this is the danger of any metric, right? Um, a really good story is, right, we, we advertised for years, reduce your page load time and, so, and, and reduce your speed index and all these things. So what developers did is they shifted all of their CPU costs to right after the page load. And then everything was really janky right after that as a result. <laughs> so gaming is an inevitability uh, that we just have to kind of so I like live metrics to deal with the gaming problem, like a constantly updating metric. Um, but yeah. yeah, Pavel's point is it's not even clear that we should expose it to web developers. I, I think we don't yet know. I think from my point of view, there are so many things we have to do here, but if we could at least get to a point where we have uh, a generalized notion of whether we're doing a better job for the user um, and that works relatively reliably, that would be a pretty darn good step. Like, it's not, we're not done. We've got a long journey past that. But we're not even there, right? The way we do work now is we all optimize to our specific metrics and, and that's, that's clearly, we could do better than that. We should do better than that. And then everything else will be a follow-up. Uh, so, Anyway, that's rail. Uh, let, me, let me keep going. Um, so that's rail for one trace. Uh, John, you had a question briefly? Are those two possible from the point of view? Yeah. Um, could you say it's possible then to recognize the point of view to be a point of view? Can you know that? Uh, the question is, are rail scores uh, comparable across devices? And, and the answer is, I really hope they, they will be. Um, they're really about, did the user have a good time? So like one thing we do when we do the efficiency scoring is we normalize by number of CPUs. Um, so it's more about how much CPU work did you do. Uh, that isn't perfect, right? Uh, but that's the, the hope is to do something like that. Um, devil's in the details there, yeah. Um, lots to discuss there. So the, the other part that I want to talk about is how we do this for more than one trace. It was really cool to do this for uh, one, but it, like that's that's kind of not a lot. Um, so, very very briefly, we came up this idea of perf insights, which is, let's assume for a minute that we have a, a corpus of a huge number of traces that we gathered. Maybe we paid a, paid a QA team to to just browse the web for a week, or maybe uh, we all sat in a room once a week and we just browsed the internet. 
Um, or we figure out how to make Chrome collect these things safely. Who knows? Uh, but let's assume that we had that. Wouldn't it be cool to write a little function that does a map reduce on that? So that we could, for example, get all of the task durations out of a body of a thousand, uh, you know, about a thousand traces, a billion traces, um, just you know, from the command line or something like that. And we thought that would be pretty cool because we have questions like that that we usually have to go to like UMA for. Uh, and that, that's pretty cool, but it's also got some limitations. So we built the thing. Uh, so this is the thing we built. Um, this is all up on um, the Catapult project, which is where TraceViewer lives. So you all can kind of fiddle with it. Um, the, the core piece here is, is that you write a map reduce job that transforms a trace into a number and then a reduce job that transforms that number into sort of uh, summarized number. And you give it a body of corp, uh, a corpus of traces and press go. Um, so very, very briefly, the mappers take as input a parsed trace. We have a JavaScript API for dealing with a parsed trace. Uh, and you push numbers out to a results object where you say, you know, the total number of processes in my trace is blah, blah, blah. Or for example, you get all the, the slices in the model, which is all the squares, and you get, say, the title of the slice, and you say, I want to know the user-friendly category of that, da 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 You process it a bit, and then you shove it into the, the results. Um, and you run it, and you get a pretty demo, which I'll show. So then we bolted a GUI on top of this. So the, the low level produces a JSON blob, and then if you're feeling ambitious, you can pipe this to D8, uh, or to, um, yeah, D3. D3. The, you know, you, you pipe it to some viz package, right? And you can have a pretty demo. So this is ours. Um, so what I've done is I've mapped uh, 50 traces in this case from Windows. Uh, and I've just taken all of the task names out of the trace and summed them up. And so we can see, for example, that GC is quite, quite high. But we can also see a histogram of the GC times. And if I do this, I can see all of the traces that have a GC time in that range. And so if I then click this, I'm not going to do it just for brevity. If I click this, I can go right to that trace and see that trace and see what the heck's going on with these GCs. So if I'm, for example, on a hunt to reduce an outlier in my project, uh, I might go after the upper bins. Or if I'm after moving the, the centroid, I might pick up some traces here and dig in. But there are a lot of trace, you know, there are a lot of trace events in Chromium. I mean, this is a long, long, long list of things, right? Um, you know, GPU, command buffer, stub, on, wait for blah. You know, it's useless. Um, but what you can do is group it. Uh, so this is just remapping it with, uh, with some user-friendly names on it. So we've taken and built up a little table that says, uh, you know, when you see these three, four things, those are actually just parsing. And so then I can sort by that, and I can see that, you know, in fact, GC remains kind of at the top. Um, and script is, script is up there. Uh, but we've been talking about rail, right? So wouldn't it be great, because we've, we've all talked about how page load has a very different workload than uh, when you're, say, scrolling a page, right? These are very different workloads. Um, or are they? So we can group by rail stage. So this is just us taking the same logic that allows us to compute a rail score, and instead of using it to do a scoring operation, we're just saying, hey, for this given event, is it in an R phase, or is it in an A phase, or is it during L? And from there, we can see, for example, that during page load, let me sort, uh, GC is pretty high up there. There's a lot of uninstrumented time in page load. Layout's up there. But then we can look down at costs during animate and see that actually GPU is quite high up there on animate. Right? And this kind of validates why we're spending so much time making the GPU stack really good during animate. Right? Um, but for example, you know, when we're working on load, Right? It often is the case that when we ship an improvement to GC, uh, we announce a page load improvement. Um, and this is kind of validating that. And like with the previous bits, you can find the outliers and, and dig in. Uh, but you don't have to stop there. So one final demo. Um, what scripts are hot during page load? So we can take all of the V8 sampling data and start pulling out um, from pardon me, uh, from this we can turn on script, go into there, and we can see stuff like, uh, and this is a small, this is only 50 traces, so the data set's small, but we can see stuff like, um, here are some heavy scripts going uh, during page load, 
here are some heavy extensions during page load. You know, here are some particularly heavy ones, and so on. So we think this technique has some promise. Um, there are a lot of things we have to do to prove this out. But this idea of working through a lot of trace data and extracting high-level understanding from it um, just feels very different from how we've usually worked. And I thought it was worth sharing with everybody here. Um, so that's, that's that bit. And if you've heard perf insights, if you've heard map traces, this is what people are referring to. If you want to get a corpus of traces to work with, we don't have any that we can give out because they're Google uh, internal, because usually there's user data in them. But if you want to know how to build up your own corpus for your own use, uh, you can talk to these two folks uh, afterward. They'll be happy to help you out. Um, I'd love to be able to say we have something, but you know, a lot of stuff to play with. Um, if you want to learn how to do this, though, uh, to actually write the trace processing, here's yet another short link. Um, I'll leave that up for a minute so people can get it. Um, this will also be on the, the, the slide deck will be on the, uh, on the agenda shortly. So anyway, where we're headed is, um, is attacking the same slide that Dimitri showed before, which is that you know, Rail starts at responding to users, but it quickly becomes these other issues like battery and memory and you know, are you using too much bandwidth if you're on a bandwidth limited connection and stuff like that. And we think that the same techniques we're using to compute responsiveness can generalize to that. So you can kind of expect us to try to play with that. We might end up doing something that's a little bit plus plus to Rail as a result. Um, and thus, this slide is born. Um, I think this really gets to us trying to come up with a way to quantify user happiness. Not because it'll be the metric that everybody works with every day, but because it'll be the way that we check that we're really moving the overall needle somewhere uh, with data rather than just with sort of assertions. Uh, and then down at the low level, we're going to be trying to make these low level trace analyses more robust. So we had a little uh, talkathon earlier about frame blaming which is about trying to figure out costs per ad. Uh, we're going to be looking at trying to figure out how to make these bulk data available to everybody. Maybe you'll get to use that dashboard that I just showed without being able to click links. We'll figure that out. Um, and then in the long run, there's definitely a, an open question about how to expose or what to expose to web developers. A lot of thoughts there, no real concrete next steps that I, I can think of yet. So, uh, so that's, that's my spiel. I, I really thank everybody for putting up. You do questions. I forget how long we've got. Uh, yeah, thanks. I'll put that up to mesmerize everyone. Uh, the first one um, for the MapReduce demo. The second one, I probably missed that. Uh, the question was, what was the, the input set for this data? All the trace files. Yeah, basically. so this is collected from us having a bunch of people who are running with tracing okay. turned on in okay. a thing called deep reporting mode. It cool. Basically, you, you hack on your Chrome enough, and it'll just start saving traces to a server that you stand up. And then, uh, because I didn't want the demo, if the demo crashed, I wanted to be able to rerun it. I limited it to 50 traces, because it takes a little while. Super, uh, yeah. super useful. Um, my second question, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly. There was a slide where you, uh, I think, penalized the um, rail score when, you, when multiple uh, CPUs were in use. Mm. What's the reasoning behind that? Because yeah. like, for, like for V8, or for especially for HEC, we want to bet on multiple threats to get the work done faster yeah. and to decrease chunk. And it's basically going to be, you have like, some constant amount of work you which you have to do. And if you can split it up, the work over multiple threads, then yeah. of course your response time will be faster. Great question. So, you know, we, we all ultimately are sharing the user's happiness, right? So we need to, what you're kind of poking at is, the prevailing wisdom has been just spit things off to the threads and that's unilaterally good. The, the reality of people who've been working with sys traces for a while you know, people who've done that know that the CPU isn't in fact free. And a really good way of looking at that is, see this, this trace here? This is a raster task. And um, in the trace viewer, I, I, this is a roundabout way. I'm going to get to what you're poking at. Trace viewer shows this. See how that's kind of hollow? It's got a lighter color in it. Um, when you see this, it says, oh, I'm three <coughs> milliseconds long in wall time. But in CPU time, it's actually very short. 
And what's happening there is the kernel's not running it for the vast majority of this time. And this is because the CPU is finite. So just adding threads is not necessarily a good strategy. So that's why we're trying to penalize with, uh, with oversaturation of the CPU. I don't think we've landed on the perfect way to capture this. So the, the thing that we have is <laughs> Louis threw a dart, you know, and it was like, okay, that sounds good. Um, I hope we'll get to a more nuanced thing that kind of captures the notion that, like, this thing here is urgent, and this thing here is not critical. It's background work. So, for example, probably like some, some V8GC that's backgroundy or some parse is optional, but it's nice to do. And when we see that some of those work are causing DSCADs, then we're going to score that, score that way down. But when it's good, hopefully the number will stay up. That would be my ideal. Getting there may be real tough. So this is our like dartboard solution. That, that would sound like the more fairer. Yeah. Approach, right? like the, but the key thing is once you start thinking in the space, you start thinking about the actual, like you, when, you, when you start critiquing rail score, what you really start doing is you realize the, the inconsistencies in how we work right now. Right? Like we just added all of this memory pressure in order to speed up this thing. And memory pressure should theoretically factor into an overall goal in a very abstract way. Maybe we won't be able to quantify everything until like the heat death of the universe, but it's probably worth trying. <laughs> Everybody falling asleep? Success. I didn't leave that up. I should have asked if everybody was mesmerized. Where is it? Too hard to get to. There we go. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I'll be around to chat, as will other people who worked on this.